received his master's and PhD in nuclear engineering here at Berkeley. And he worked at Lawrence Livermore National Lab on a wide variety of aspects of nuclear weapons research. He was also involved in the testing of He later went to Bolt Law School at Berkeley, got a law degree, and served as a practicing attorney in San Francisco. He also became a very and uh, has done a lot of work on aviation law and also a number of other issues related to uh, related to aviation. And here he is a scientist in residence at uh, at Middlebury. He also teaches courses on drones. The summer course in cybersecurity. because Dr. Moore was for several years at the IAEA in Vienna, and his field was safeguards and verification of arms control agreements. And he's gonna really tell you a lot about the history of IAEA and the safeguards program and how it really works on the ground, what the opportunities are, and what the problems are. So we're really delighted to welcome Dr. George Moore. At the IAEA, I was a senior analyst in the Office of Nuclear Security, which is now the Division of Nuclear Security. So working with safeguards was an adjunct to what I did. I didn't directly work with safeguards. But we're going to talk about a number of things tonight. We'll talk about the history of safeguards. We'll talk about, and it's important for you to understand, that different countries have different safeguard regimes. Most people think of safeguards as resulting from the non-proliferation treaty. That's true. That as a result of the NPT for most countries. But there are a number of countries that have pre-NPT safeguards. So we'll talk about that and hopefully give you a picture of those issues. Now, safeguards to many people off the street mean keeping nuclear materials secure. Um, that's not really what the safeguards people at the IAEA do. They are more into material accountancy. In other words, ensuring that the material is there and has not been diverted from peaceful purposes. So we'll talk about how that plays out. Throughout this, you know, when you have questions asked, uh, or we'll miss a question, wait till the end, I probably won't remember what the answer is anyway. So, uh, <clears throat> the IAEA is not, directly part of the UN, and this confuses some people. It's a separate international organization, has its own director general. Uh, in point of fact, the DG, the Giamano, is at the same level as Ban Ki-moon. In a practical sense, that's not true. So when Ban Ki-moon, the DG from uh, UN, comes to IAEA, then everybody turns out and you know, uh, pays tribute to the larger organization, but the membership is not the same. Um, the IAEA has its own separate membership, uh, and it works somewhat differently. Although, if you're working there, you're an international civil servant, you carry a lazy passe international passport for most of the people who work there. Currently, the DG is Yoki Omano from Japan. Prior to him, it was Mohammed El Baradai, and you go back to Hans Flicks. And there's been a series of DGs. Uh, there will probably never be an American director general, uh, the way the agency works. And one thing you need to understand, we'll talk about this maybe a little bit later. Uh, everyone pays great attention to where people come from. When I was at the IAEA, I was what's called a CFP, cost free expert. The US State Department paid money to IAEA to employ me there. And when the, uh, the current uh, uh, Secretary Moniz, but prior uh, Secretary of DOE, I'm blocking his name right now, came going through the reception line for him. And I said, well, Mr. Secretary, that means that for the agency, I'm free and it costs you money for me to be here. 
the strain of death or but it was kind of fun. Uh, so the way the IAE is structured at the very top, we have the director general. He has his staff and support staff. Below that, there are deputy director generals who run the principal components of the agency. We could put up an orange chart and you forget about it about five minutes and then forget about it even quicker. But the prime DDGs are safeguards, safeguards at the IAEA. The second largest probably is technical cooperation, which you don't hear much about. TC is the element of the IAEA that provides the other side the quid pro quo of the NPT and provides training in nuclear methods and methodology to member states. It is also one of the places where the IAEA may have some influence. Contrary to most popular belief, the IAEA is not a regulatory agency. It does not inspect the reactors. It does not go around and tell people that they have to do this or have to do that. It provides guidance. Now, there is one minor exception other than the safeguards. Safeguards is a different piece. But if a country does not conform to IAEA safety standards on the nuclear side, they're not supposed to get TC funding for programs. So that's not always honored, but it is one of the uh, stated purposes of the safety program. So the EDG's primary safeguards, then there's safety and security. So safety and security are lumped together uh, and TC. And then there are other EDGs for things like human resources and things that make the agency run. All right, below the EDGs, they have below these big departments, there are divisions. And security is now a division. Security started out uh, after 9-11. It was a new concept, and we'll talk a little bit later about the fact that up until even a couple of years ago, there's been a big debate about whether security is actually an IAEA function. If you look at the statute of the IAEA, you will find no mention whatsoever of security. And several states have said, well, it's not there, so you're not supposed to be doing that. That's a, that's a state function. IAEA has no business talking to us about security. That's pretty much that position primarily Argentina, every once in a while, that basically is that. So the divisions, um, and then below the divisions, you have sections and you have you know, various breakdowns of the division chart. Okay, so after World War II, you know, which you know that there were bombs in Nagasaki, Hiroshima, U.S. is the only nuclear power, United Nations formed. Where was the United Nations born? Sure. San Francisco. San Francisco, sure, yeah. If you go over there, there's a huge monument, right? Nah, it's a big monument. There's a little plaque. <laughs> opera outside there. It's, a, it's just one word. Uh, the places of defunct League of Nations. And everybody's thinking, well, how can you control nuclear weapons? Now, maybe you guys have covered this. If you have, tell me and we'll, we'll go through this even quicker. What gets formed is the UN Atomic Energy Commission. How many people have heard of that? UNAEC. Couple. Where is it now? Those of you who heard, what happened to it? It went away. Okay. The idea was to come up with something. You know, we had, we were developing in the United States the Atomic Energy Commission. Everybody thought the UN ought to have one. Uh, was <laughs> Resolution One of the UN General Assembly established the UN agency? Uh, Disbanded in 1952, but it was really functionally useless after July of 1949 because the Russians blocked everything. And they were developing their bomb, and their bomb went off shortly after things became totally dysfunctional, but it was never resurrected. So, out of the residue of the UNAEC really came the IAEA. But the UNAEC is where we first get a making of safeguards. And if you look, this is part of the original document. <coughs> Protective safeguards by way of inspection and other means to protect compliance with the and hazardous violations of the This is keeping material in a peaceful, peaceful program. So you're probably all aware of the Baruch plan based on the Atchison Lilly and Ball report. And this idea that you know we would 
give up control of nuclear weapons to the UN, uh, given that there were certain criteria. And we never forget the criteria that uh, had to be veto proof UN control. Blocked by the USSR and the Security Council because they were working as fast as they could on their own program. Uh, so, the Cold War then starts up Adams for Peace in '53, and as a follow on to Adams for Peace, you get the establishment of the IAEA in '57. Uh, France goes over in '60, China goes over in '64. And then you have the NPT, which went through the development phase, and by 1970, it was in effect. So you know, it's a long development phase. So the NPT wasn't, you know, people got together for a weekend and said, this is a great idea, let's, uh, let's all do this. It's a long development process. And this is one of the things that when you work at the IAEA, you find that doing things by consensus is very, very excruciatingly painful at times. Uh, the way a document, and I was in charge of the fundamentals of nuclear security document at the IAEA, I inherited it from somebody who worked on it for two years. I worked on it for three years and finally got it approved just before I left and got out shortly after I left. Um, if you look at it, it looks like it was written by a bunch of kids at Berkeley High School. It's not a very impressive document. It's a high level document, but to get consensus on that document, we had to have two technical meetings. The document is developed to get experts from various areas, which the IAEA selects the experts. I don't know, just you know, walk down the street and see who's an expert. We take people and then we think are, are, you know, we're able to work with. And sometimes there's some political influence, you know. And it, the ambassador from some state will call up and say, you know, I understand you're doing this document. Why don't you have an expert from my country? So then there's some back and forth and maybe get an expert from their country. So you work through this document. And if you spend all day with, or all morning sometimes with a group where it was insisting that an and is a wrong word to use in a sentence, you get very bored very fast with doing a lot of these things, and this happens. Then you have what's called an open technical meeting. And an open technical meeting, you invite all the member states of the IAEA, and the IAEA pays for usually two representatives from each of the member states who can't afford it, and that's when I was there, China plus everybody else. Why couldn't China afford it? Well, it's just tradition. You pay for the Chinese delegates to come. So, States and you're paying for, you know, maybe 300 people to come to an open technical meeting, and you're paying maybe them outside, which we did one time because we had a blockage on internal conference rooms. This can cost you a half million euro per meeting, which is not a trivial drop. You know, you've had people from pick a state that you like, and you've had experts who help develop the document. Do you get the expert from the state to develop the document? No. You get the person who wants to go on a shopping trip to Vienna. And so you get strange things that happen for three or four days. People saying, well, I don't understand this portion of the document. And they're from a country which had an expert who worked on the document and should have briefed them on it, but you waste enormous amounts of time doing this. And if you can't get a consensus at an open text meeting, which we could not have fundamentals the first time around, then you have more work if you have another open meeting. Then after the open meeting has approved the document, it goes out for member state review, and you can get a thousand comments which you have to document and then deal with and adjust, and then the document to a group uh, which I helped organize that, that works on documents, but before that, it went to the uh, board for approval, board of directors. The IAEA is run by a board of governors. They meet four, three or four times a year. The primary meeting is in September, and in September, there's a general meeting 
And that's all the member states. And that's a big week-long meeting, which you have the board of directors called by the general meeting. And they basically then approve the things that the board has said you should approve. There's rarely something that goes on in the general meeting that does not approve what the board has recommended. The board membership rotates, uh, presidency of the board rotates, but there are standing members, basically the nuclear weapon states are all standing members of the board. But they don't have veto power like they do in the U.S. It's not like the U.S. Security Council. The agency reports not to the General Assembly of the U.N., he reports to the Security Council. And that's the that's set up by statute. That's the way that works. Okay, so. Uh, the statute of the IAEA uh, advised you to read that at some point in time because there's a lot of weirdness in it uh, in terms of the way people think modern. Uh, we would always get, for example, the IAEA would report in a year that there were 20 seizures of nuclear material around the world. And what did that mean? That doesn't mean special nuclear material like we talk about it here in the United States. Here in the United States, we talk about special nuclear material, the stuff you can make a weapon out of, a bomb. IAEA, by their statute, nuclear material means anything basically that has uranium content, except ores. So if they found a chunk of depleted uranium someplace and that got reported, uh, that would be a nuclear material seizure. Okay. Uh, Article 12 sets up the safeguard program with staff and inspectors. So right from the beginning, the provision, original provision of the IAEA set up safeguards. It's primary function. The IAEA, when it started, was in a, an old hotel building down on the ring in Vienna. Now it has. Who are the original members of the IAEA and how is membership decided? Uh, did, you, did you repeat that? So, did you repeat the question? Oh, uh, my question was, who are the original members of the IAEA and how is membership decided? Well, the original members who organized it were basically the nuclear weapon states, the key group of, of nuclear weapon states, plus some others. But there was a historical add on to membership. I mean, there's you, you can actually, there's a publication to look at which tells you what year the members started out. But at the beginning, I don't know what the original number It went in stages. And, uh, so, the way the IAEA does issues guidance, or in terms of sometimes when it's essentially the NPT regulations, are through information circulars. Now that sounds like it should be just something fun, but inserts are the way they do business. And insert 26, which was issued in 1961, established safeguards pre-NPT for research tests and power reactors, less than 100 megawatts thermal, and insert 66 and uh, the 26 in 61 established an initial program in 66. In 1967, both were pre-NPT. So, when you look at a non-NPT state like India, it may have safeguards at some facilities. They're pre-NPT safeguards. They may have also agreed to safeguards under some other agreement. For example, the nuclear suppliers group may require that you implement comprehensive except for the pre-NPT states were covered by blanket inserts. Okay, so uh, pre-NPT safeguards rely on the states to declare facilities. In other words, you have to say, we have a facility that falls under this and you should come, come over and inspect it. Uh, actually, the comprehensive safeguards also require a declaration, but there it's demanded. If you're, if you don't, if you're a pre-NPT state, that you're, the onus is on you to do that, and then you get safeguards. 
if you're posting PTC under that agreement and you do not declare something and there's time limits, like you're supposed to declare that a facility is going to be used with nuclear material, I think it's a year, you can check that maybe long time frame, a year before material is introduced into the facility. This is where Iran got into some problems. Some things they declared as facilities, but they waited until they had material in the facility, and that causes problems and it's a violation of the of the safeguards of the So, NTT requires states to accept safeguards on all nuclear materials per Article 3. Do you have a question on that? Sure. It does, has nothing to do with nuclear capability. NPT deals with the possession of nuclear material. Okay. And, and the safeguarding is of nuclear material and nuclear facilities. But it has nothing to do with weapons per se. So when you use that term, I'm not sure what exactly you're trying to get at. But so some of the states that had pre NPT safeguards, in fact, the majority of the states that had pre NPT safeguards. When they, when they became members of the NPT, then that transferred over. But there's still this residue of the non-NPT states, Israel, India, Pakistan, there's a couple of others. Uh, you would say North Korea is a non-NPT state, but there's even a debate about that because of the way, the way North Korea withdrew. Some people argue that it didn't do a timely withdrawal and didn't conform with is that at the NPT conference, the chairman still carries around a placard for North Korea in case they show up. I don't know if that's true or not. Uh, so, uh, let's go on. Uh, the NPT requires each state then to execute an agreement with the IAEA, and these are state by state agreements. There's no there's no one, you know, there's a guide agreement and what's supposed to be in it, but there's actually differences among the agreements from state to state. And that's insert 153, defines the agreement between the states and the IE for certain the NPT. This is referred to as comprehensive safeguards. And so you'll see the term comprehensive safeguards appear in things like the nuclear suppliers group. They will agree not to provide technology two states that don't have comprehensive safeguards in place, for example. Uh, U.S. has their own domestic agreements. These are known as one, two, three agreements, or bilateral agreements with various states. And those are also usually key to comprehensive safeguards. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's, you know, your insert one, five, three, that, which covers everybody who's an NPT signatory. Now you'll see that subsequent to that, there's another level of safeguarding we call the model protocol, which raises a higher standard. And then there's another insert that raises a lower standard, which is called a small quantities protocol. So if states don't have a lot of nuclear material, why should they go through all of the machinations of doing all the reporting and having inspectors come, et cetera, et cetera. So that's important to understand too. Okay, um, the terms that the IAEA uses are not nuclear material. They use source and special fissionable material. Special fissionable material is uranium and plutonium, and source material includes thorium. So these are safeguarded commodities under Article 20. Uh, I once did a paper a couple of years ago for the INM and pointed out that there's, I don't know, about 10 or 12 defi different definitions of nuclear material. INM is the Institute of Nuclear Materials Management. I also pointed out that the Institute of Nuclear Materials Management had nothing in their statutes that defined what nuclear material was. So, you know, it's, uh, when you say nuclear material, you gotta be very specific. And at the end, we'll show that, you know, there are some specific things and there are some conflicts. For example, the classic nuclear security guidance for nuclear materials, such as uranium, plutonium, et cetera, is insert 225, it's currently revision five. 
That's different from what's in the CPPNM, the Convention on the Physical Protection of Nuclear Material. It's a very subtle difference that appears in one, one footnote, but could be important at some point in time. Uh, so we'll provide with that. Uh, 153, well, the way it works, the statement's an initial declaration. In other words, it says, here's what we have for nuclear material. And then that gets verified by the inspectors. So what happens if a state lies? The odds of finding that are not that great in some states. I mean, that's, that's just a reality. You know, it requires the state to make an initial declaration, and then that material gets tracked throughout its lifetime. It gets tracked by the things that the elements of actual safeguarding the material, things like seals, inspectors going into power plants, looking with horoscopes down into fuel ponds and things like that, the kinds of things that you see on NOVA programs and that sort of thing, the IA inspector doing this or that. Uh, that's what is done. And it is not done to prevent or diversion, meaning taking it from peaceful uses to non peaceful uses. It's not, the inspections are not done to prevent diversion, and safeguards is not done to prevent diversion. It is done to detect diversion. And it's a very different conceptual point. In other words, the safeguards people don't come in and say, you got to have all this stuff locked up and in a secure vault, you know, and this and that. They come in and say, well, we want to see the seals that we put on here last time are still in place. And they have special seals that make it difficult to, to tamper with the seals, tamper-proof seals. So they inspect the seals. Looks like everything's still there. Fine. You know, whether somebody can steal that material two days from now is a different issue. And we'll talk about another term. If I forget to mention it, I'll write it on the board so I don't. It's significant quantity. Let me back to that because it has meaning and it goes with this idea of detecting diversion. It's a political uh, football to some extent. Okay. Well, was impressive. It's defined for the stuff that you can build bombs on. Okay. And it's Basically, an amount that will establish a weapons program. And a lot of people get confused on this. For uranium, we're looking at 25 kilograms of 235. And there are a bunch of ways that you can have that. So there's actually an SQ for having uh, you know, north, natural uranium, there's an SQ for metal, there's an SQ for other things. But basically, whatever it is, it's 25 kilograms. Of uranium 235 process. But plutonium is 8 kilograms. That is, plutonium is better stuff for making weapons. So that SQ is low. Many people, I don't know, pick a number you like, 90, 95% of the people in Washington equate this with how much you need to make a bomb. It is not what you need to make a bomb. If you want to read a good story or a good paper about that, Google Cochran, uh, Thomas Cochran at uh, uh, Scientists, uh, uh, it's, it's the National Choices Defense Council, yeah. NRDC. And you'll find a paper written about 20 years ago talking about how much it takes to build a bomb. The Department of Energy will say for plutonium. They'll admit that you can build a bomb with four kilograms. So this is, don't confuse this with the amount to build a bomb. It's a political football because this is what the inspection criteria for safeguards are keyed on. So if you drop the SQ for plutonium from eight kilograms down to four kilograms, you'd have to double the frequency of the inspector. The SQ is set up so that the inspection interval, when you come back, you should be able to detect whether an SQ is missing. So 
that, you know, you look at what types of facilities are there, if they've got a reprocessing plan, if they have this or that, how could they get an SQ or divert an SQ? And you have to set your inspection criteria so that that matches. So if you change this, it has a real big impact on the budgeting of the IAEA, which is very tight as it is. The budget of the IAEA in U.S. budget terms is fairly trivial. We're talking about, I don't remember off the top of my head, it's something like a half a billion dollars total, maybe 400 million, something like that. And it gets confusing because I can't remember if it's in euro or in dollars. But in the overall global scheme of things, it's not much. And some of the stuff is not even funded out of regular budget. The majority of the funding for nuclear security, which is gun guards and gates, information, a bunch of other things, is done by what's called the Nuclear Security Fund, and that's voluntary contributions of member states. So the head of nuclear security goes around hat and hand, spends a lot of his time out trying to get people to donate to the Nuclear Security Fund. Biggest donor of the Nuclear Security Fund used to be the US and now it's the EU. But you know, it's always problematic. And it turns out it's a little embarrassing being here as an American because the US is a slow pay. And I remember visiting congressional and senatorial delegation. I was one of the briefers, the briefer after me was the DDG for uh, finance. And he made this point. He said, You guys, and he was an American, you guys got to pay your bill on time because we can't operate without the money. You're a big donor and we're, we're short of money. We're kind of like taking out, we want to take out loans. So this idea that they might have to take out loans. Question? No, yeah. Um, could you speak to or reference some of the resources for how the industry is setting up the state system for county control and also the significant quantity came about? Um, it seemed like a very particular path that we're chosen. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, it, I don't know whether you all have open access to what's called GovAdm. The IAEA posts uh, most of their documents online. So I would look first uh, online at the documents. As the history of the SQ, start with Cochran's paper because he may mention it. And I think he has some references. Uh, in it. But nothing jumps to mind about you know, the whole thing. They kind of laid the foundation and framework for how everything's constrained. Yeah, no, I it, it some of this stuff goes back and some of the ideas, and we'll talk about some of the stuff that's not covered later. Like, for example, Neptunium is not covered at all. Okay. Uh, that's co called an alternative material. Uh, it's not covered by safeguards. Who has separated socks of Neptunium? Anything that you can make a critical mass out of, you can argue that you can make a bomb out of. And you can find a critical mass for neptunium, you can also find one for americium. Uh, there are other things besides uranium and plutonium that people could conceptually use to make a bomb. Nobody does that because it becomes stupid to do it, given that you have the other stuff. But it doesn't mean that you couldn't, and it doesn't mean that some clever state could not could could do that. So there's always been a question about why don't we why don't we extend security to knowledge about nuclear weapons? You know, is there a safeguarding of, of knowledge about nuclear weapons? Let's say Country X develops a program where they start, you know, their nuclear engineering people start teaching people how to build and design nuclear weapons. Is that safeguarding? Yeah. How do you deal with that? In fact, how do you deal with violations of safeguards at all? You know, the DG goes to security company. Does the Security Council do anything? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they impose sanctions. So, uh, okay. Detection of diversion and not prevention is full of safeguards. So, if you have a good safeguards program, then states should say, well, gee, we can't get away with diverting stuff. And this was the philosophy under 153. Until they found out that some of the same people in Iraq and people in Libya uh, were, you know, like ducks in the water, you know, swimming along placidly with their feet going very fast, working on weapons programs at non-declared facilities. Because gee, they found out that well, not all states are arms. They don't declare all these facilities. So uh, 
they decided that regards to the tie to export control, Zanger, Zanger Committee, the nuclear suppliers group, uh, both have ties to IE safeguards because both of them want safeguards in place for certain types of transfers to occur. Uh, the agreement, uh, if you, Bill Potter is in charge of the Monterey, or the Martin Center at, at Monterey, and Potter will say that the U.S. Indy agreement essentially was the worst thing that could happen to the NPT. You know, we never should have negotiated the agreement with India. We should have told India to either sign up for the NPT or suffer the consequences. And he feels it's very much undercut the NPT. The U.S. 123 bilateral agreements we've talked about on those. Um, small quantities protocol. This is an, in a government document, and actually, there's been a modification of this. Uh, it's designed for they still need to have an accountancy system, but it's a very simplified accounting system. I think the accountancy system is like a spreadsheet. I mean, it's got to have what, how much material you have, where it is. And there are some things about the small quantities protocol has to be. The material has to be in things that are not things like nuclear power plants. Uh, the material has to be in things like university research facilities, places like that. So that there's some ability, uh, well, but you're not using the small quantities protocol to somehow get around safeguards. So you don't, they really don't, for the most part, after verifying the initial declaration of this, they don't do much with these small quantity states. One of the key questions at the IAEA about state farms comes up in the following way. Um, the Iranians will claim, somewhat justifiably so, that they're being persecuted. So there's a lot of inspections of them. Why aren't we inspecting the Canadians vigorously as we're inspecting the Iranians? Well, I always, you know, I always like to use Canada as an example of you know, somebody who's at high But uh, uh, there's a certain amount of it, evenness that has to go on in inspections. And the former DDG, uh, well, Ali Hainonen, who's now at, at the Kennedy School, and the uh, uh, photo succeeded him was a, a Belgian, he used to argue and try and make presentations to the board uh, we have a limited budget we really ought to have more inspections in countries where we have more concerns about verification and fewer in countries where we have little concern about verification well that doesn't go over with the general assembly and with the board of directors it's like you know you've got to be you've got to be perceived as a neutral inspection party if you discover something in some of your inspections, then maybe that's a reason then to do some more inspections, but not to a priori make decisions about who should have more frequent inspections. Okay. Uh, all of these countries uh, show that the NPT safeguards system being gained and that the 153 safeguards might not be sufficient. So then they went to model of additional protocol, insert 5.0. And this expands the information states to provide. Now, this is not a required protocol. There's nothing in the NPT that requires that states sign up for this. This is kind of a, a good faith effort on behalf, behalf of the states to say, you know, we're really clean. You have this enhanced inspection right. Primarily, uh, you get a right to a lot of short notice inspections to come in and look at things that maybe you found, you know, that the agency has found from satellite imagery, which the agency now uses. They use commercial satellite imagery. Uh, maybe some member state has revealed some intelligence information. And that's a very thorny issue uh, because you know, if you release intelligence information to the IEA, do all member states then have a right to it? Uh, you know, where, where, is that, where is that lesion? Uh, allows for environmental sampling to verify that you know, certain things are happening or not happening. Uh, this leads to what's called a state-level approach for safeguards, as opposed to a facility-level approach. And 
About two years ago, maybe three years ago, there was a great perturbation in the board and in the General Assembly. The uh, about state level safeguards. A lot of member states felt that the agency was essentially doing something that they hadn't been authorized to do, that they were implementing the model protocol for all states without the states agreeing to it. However, if you look back at Insert 153, a lot of the elements for state level pro state level uh, inspection or focus uh, are there. So there's been an argument back and forth, but now I think most of the member states accept the fact that even without additional protocols, the agency has the right to question activities other than at declared facilities and to make inspections of areas other than declared facilities. But that's still an argument that gives the agency rights to do a lot of things. But states retain certain rights. I know you have a problem that deals with Iran. Uh, you know, Iran can say they can essentially blackball inspectors from various countries. So it's very hard to get an inspector into Iran from US, UK, France, even from Russia. They're more willing to take Russian inspectors, but you know. The agency has their inspectors and you can't just send out an inspector without the acceptance by that member state. And some countries have been very uh, non-cooperative in terms of, of essentially prohibiting inspectors to come in. Okay, um, so there are inspections, a lot of material that's not in use, in other words, like fuel assemblies that are not being used or fuel assemblies not so much they're in storage, but the ones that are not being used are tagged. They have tamper resistant seals. It's a methodology that's been developed by the agency that will allow people to come back in later inspect to ensure that that material has not been moved or played with or, or things taken out of the fuel. Uh, they have some assaying methods. These are mostly using detection systems that are specially set up so that you can go in, for example, and look at a fuel rod to see that it's still fully loaded before it goes in. No reason removing fuel from it. Same thing for after exposure in the reactor. It's in the pond. There are devices that can go down and creep along the fuel rod and make sure that nobody's been taking the lower third of the fuel rod out for reprocessing or something like that. There are real time monitoring things where you, for example, have a video camera monitoring a critical area where it's either storing the data or sometimes streaming the data. The newest thing is to stream the data back to the agency. So, uh, and then there are intelligence-like activities. In other words, monitoring things from Vienna that they can monitor, uh, primarily overhead in between. So there's this whole group of things. The agency is not an intelligence operation. If you want to read, uh, I'm always a guy who was, uh, he was head of DOE intelligence. Uh, it was a big crazy. It was actually using Kennedy School as well. Uh, Ralph Moat Larson. Ralph Moat Larson, it's a hyphenated last name, uh, keeps proposing that the IAEA should be a, an international intelligence agency and have intelligence agency assets in order to ferret out uh, illegal weapons programs. Uh, so what is the relationship between safeguards and non-proliferation? Doesn't prevent non-proliferation. It slows it down, makes it aware. Uh, what if the country just decides, I'm not gonna be a member of the NPD? I wave, you know, I'm out of here, safeguards are even still longer fly us. There is no penalty in the NPD for dropping out of the NPD. People have discussed this. People have said, you know, once you sign on, pardon me? Yeah. Right. Right. If you if you signed on to the additional protocol, but well, that's true. That there could be some states that sign on the additional protocol which maybe would get into that situation. But the question is who's gonna who's gonna do this? Uh, so 
safeguards at best raises awareness of when proliferation might be happening. Okay. This prevent it, discourages proliferance, doesn't prevent it, but it may raise awareness of it. And there are loopholes. Uh, one is is non-weapons -mil non military use. For example, naval propulsion. Uh, you can use, you can, there's nothing that would have prevented Iran, and Iran made some loose statements about this at one point in time. They said, well, we want to enrich beyond 20% so we can have fuel for these nuclear submarines that we're going to build. Of course, they don't have the ability to build nuclear submarines, but it's a good argument. Uh, how many of you know that India has built a nuclear submarine? Okay. Uh, so India has built a nuclear submarine. India actually leased two nuclear submarines from first of the Soviet Union and another one from the Russian Federation. And there's kind of an arms control question about whether we should allow people to lease nuclear submarines. Pakistan is now looking at maybe leasing the Chinese nuclear submarine so that they can counterbalance the Indian Ocean. But there are non-weapons military uses of nuclear materials. And for example, the propulsion is one, space reactors are another. How many reactors are over in the earth right now? The real question, how many were? One? One thousand? Pardon me? None? No, that's wrong. Uh, too many. <laughs> In the old days of the Cold War, uh, both the Soviet Union and the U.S., primarily the Soviet Union, flew reactors in space. Uh, the Russians, I use Russians synonymously with the Soviet Union, it's hard to say Soviet Union repeatedly. The question. Are these uh, RTGs or reactors? No, these are reactors. There are some RTGs as well. RTGs went on all the Apollo missions. In, huge quantities of plutonium-238. And when you read some of the definitions of nuclear material, you will find that if it's more than 80% plutonium-238, plutonium is exempted from like the and from insert-225. And the reason for that is the big girl in the room was the United States saying, we don't want this stuff covered because that's what we use for RTGs. RTG is a, uh, we call it a nuclear battery, a radioisotopic thermal generator use the radioactive decay to heat up essentially a metal and boil off a little bit. do that, you close the circuit and you have a battery, a high power battery. Um, we used plutonium-238 in our RTGs. We bought that from the Russian Federation after the Soviet Union collapsed. We just started making our own plutonium-238 about a year ago, again, because relations with the Russian Federation have deteriorated the point where we can't get it from them anymore, and we need it. Uh, the Russians use strontium 90 for the same thing. There, there are RTGs with strontium 90. Uh, they, yes, What are we using for? What are we using for? Um, when you put up a set, depends on what power load, what you need for power on, this, on the satellite uh, or manned vehicle. And solar panels have limits. So if you can't meet the energy needs with solar panels, then you go to RTGs. Again, yeah, these RTGs go to the reactors. We had a series of reactors in the nuclear something propulsion reactors. The Russians flew a lot of warsats. These were radar reconnaissance satellites. They flew in low Earth orbit with downlinking radars to observe U.S. Navy fleet movements. They always had a warsat up and operational, and they always had one on the pad at Baikonur ready to launch. Uh, if you Google Cosmos 954, you will find Cosmos 954 was the Soviet war which didn't do what it was supposed to do. What it was supposed to do was fly in low Earth orbit, and at the end of its useful satellite life, boost into a high orbit to decay. And instead, Cosmos 954 degraded, came in, crashed up in the Great Slave Lake of Canada spread itself about 200 miles along the path down the Great State Lake. Uh, subsequent to that, 
there was another one, Cosmos 1052, I think, which was going to come back in the last calculation we had on it, it was going to come into Central Europe and crash, which would have been kind of exciting, but it skipped and the next pass crashed in the Indian Ocean, not far from Diego Garcia, which I've never seen again. So, uh, you know, flying reactors in space. So they're up sitting in decaying orbits, uh, a number of reactors right now. Uh, anybody find 1052 or 1062? I can't remember. Something like that. So, yes. So they're, they're at orbital decay when they boost up. What, what are we talking about? Well, they decay, yes, thousands of years. So, they, you know, unless you interfere with them in an ASAT program or something like that, they're going to stay up there and just sit in decay. But two of them came back in. Uh, we also had snap series. We actually bought a, uh, uh, the Moshko or Topaz from the Russians after the, after the Soviet Union collapsed because uh, we wanted to get back into reactors and space program and snap program. Technology was older and the Russians had these things that they were flying with Topaz. Um, it turned out once we got it, we wanted to send it back. We couldn't send it back for some tax reasons or export control reasons. It's a weird story. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, there are other loopholes uh, as well. You could build a military power reactor. Uh, we had one. Uh, you all talk about the SL1 accident. Uh, SL1 was kind of Hindenburg mil military reactors. It's an accident that occurred at Idaho Falls. It's the only reactor accident that's actually killed. Me. Three people were killed in that A core uh, went prompt critical uh, steam explosion, killed everybody. Uh, okay, and it also doesn't, as we talked about, cover all weapons, all things you can make weapons out of, or safeguards. But right now, the only states that have large holdings of, like, Neptunium, if you think about it, those of you who are nuclear engineers, how do you make plutonium 238? If you look at the table of isotopes, you'll find the only convenient way to make it is to irradiate Neptunium 237, which means you have to have large stocks of Neptunium 237, which presumably the Soviet. Russian Federation has in order to make the to create. But nobody would want to make a weapon out of it. So, okay, so a few minutes we'll finish up here. Uh, safeguards is not safety and the security, uh, both of which are separate aspects of IEA programs. Safeguards is mandatory, safety and security aren't, other than the exception that you don't get PC funds if you don't correspond with the safety, not the security. There's no higher security. Uh, uh, safeguards has its own classification system. And within the IAEA, if it's safeguards confidential or safeguards classified as safeguards secret, it never comes out of safeguards. So other people who work at the agency cannot see material which is classified out of safeguards agreements with the states. And a little bit strange. Uh, Safeguards also has nothing to do with other types of radioactive material. So cobalt-60 sources, iridium-192 sources, cesium-137 sources, all the stuff that you can make a dispersal device out of, radiological dispersal device or RGD, a simple exposure device out of, that a terrorist can use that they can steal from a hospital or a food or radiation facility or something like that. That's not, there's no safeguards for that. That at best is covered by the Code of Conduct for Radioactive Sources, which is a guidance which only covers what are called Category 1 and Category 2 sources. Who knows what Category 1 and Category 2 sources are? Show of hands. Okay. All right. Uh, agency categorizes. Oops. Somehow I lost one. Oh, I see. This is that. Because of coloration. There are five categories. Uh, the, the upper three boxes, you know, kind of above the red line, are categories one, two, and three. These are categorized by the IAEA primarily based on the activity level of the source compared with a preset value called the D value. If you look in a publication called RSG 1.9, you'll find all these D values. If you have, say, a 100 Curie source, and the D value is two, you divide A by D, you get 50, and that puts you in a category that would be a category two. So you can't, I'm sorry, you don't get copies of it, you can't see it right now. 
below the line of category four and five sources. The code of conduct only applies to category one two sources and only applies to steel sources. So you could have a big finger full of CZ-137, which would be kind of odd to have, but you could have, and it wouldn't be covered by any of this, uh, by the code of conduct at all. So there's really no guidance on security of radioactive sources. In the United States, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, 10 CFR 37, provides guidance for safety and security in category one and two sources. Um, some guidance about some of the other stuff. Um, now those are, if you could read them, they would be Arabic numbers, categories one, two, three, four, and five. There are also categories Roman one, Roman two, and Roman three. This is the way nuclear material is categorized. This is a categorization table from the CPTNM. And you then begin to look at the use of the material and you begin to look at how much you have. So category one, Roman one, sources, materials, or facilities have the most security. The security goes down. Category one is the highest level of security requirement. Category two, the leg. Category three is the least. And then category three is the footnote. And that's footnote C, and you can read it down here. You can read it. Quantity is not falling in category three, and natural grain, the three grain, thorium should be protected, at least in accordance with prudent management practices. The problem is this is actually from the uh, Uh, nowhere in the document is to define what uh, management practices. So that might be you know, keeping it in your desk. Uh, anyway, so there are these two categorization tables, both uh, by the IAEA. Uh, I know you guys are looking at the Iran agreement. Uh, so the IAEA has a big part in doing inspections. So the question is who's going to inspect, where are they going to be able to inspect, and who are the inspectors going to be? Because if the Iranians say, nobody from any state that knows anything about this stuff, uh, we've got a problem. Okay, um, that's it. I went over a little bit, but not too much. So, any questions? Any questions about working there? Any questions about the benefits of being an international civil servant? I wish there were many. Your kids get 75% of their tuition paid. Yes. How does the IAA go about, go about acquiring new like uh, safeguard technologies to like, their research and development? And what's what's the kind of like what kind of cooperation do they receive from member states? They what have them allowed. Sure. There there are two things. One is in house. They have an R and D that works on this stuff. But they also have uh, what are called uh, property research and development programs (CRDPs) with various states. Uh, Finland, for example, is very active in uh, CRDPs where. It's a joint thing where the IAEA and that state cooperate in developing new technology. So there's it's, there's an ongoing active program that, you know, if you ask the people in the program, they'll say they don't have enough money for that. If you ask them if anybody in any program, they'll do the same thing. Uh, but they, they really do, they really do work on their trying to stay up to the state of the art. You know, some of this stuff uh, becomes difficult. Requiring cooperation from the government. And, you know, if you're going to if you're going to stream something from a site, then that site has to have some connection that you that you know you can get to to get out of the site. The flip side of that is if that site has internet connection, then you have cybersecurity concerns at that site for things coming the other way. Um, but yeah, there's a there's a pretty good program, and the, the technology has developed. I mean, inspectors. Get training. The inspectors are trained. Uh, the, the typical inspector is usually a younger person in their 20s or 30s who maybe has some background work or has a degree in, in the area. Uh, they come to the agency, they receive training at the agency, then they go for inspector training, which is still conducted, at, although I think it's going to change, at a JR, an EU joint research facility at ISPRA, Italy. Where they have a reactor on site and they train people for inspecting reactors. There are other types of facilities. For example, the fuel reprocessing facility at Rikasho, they have an, that's one of the few places where they have an on site IAEA staff. Most of the things are inspectors coming for an inspection visit, uh, which is a temporary visit. 
But in Japan, that's one of the two facilities where there's an actual uh, on you know, year long, year round IAEA present. Rikasha is still not reprocessing, but it's a, it's a nightmare to try and inspect Rikasha. The IAEA tries to push a concept called safe heart by design, which is a concept of designing facilities so that the safe heart inspection can be done in a useful, you know, minimal, uh, Little interference manner, but also in a way that you can ensure that things are being safer. Rikasha has something like 5,000 miles of pipe, on it. and you know, they had to call around and verify all the pipes, all the valves. It's just a nightmare. Any other questions? I understand one of you is a, a boat school pew. No? A Naval Academy graduate? Oh, oh she's not in this. She's not in this. Well, too bad. Okay. All right. I have, I have a question about radioactive sources that are not covered by Safeco. Okay. So if uh, there was an incident, let's say with ISIS, we would have had to try to do in Brussels like this. Right. Blackmail some guy, kidnap him or whatever, and when you get radioactive materials out right. of the concrete facility, and they get them. Do you think that could stimulate an effort to broaden the safeguards to include these devices, or is it too hard? It is. ISIS is the table to deal with, and who would be opposed to it other than? I don't know that anybody would be opposed to it, conception, but it's a huge problem. Nobody knows exactly how many sources are out there. I mean, a lot of sources, you know, were just built and put out. Uh, kind of a rule of thumb if you look at category one sources, which are the really high intensity, most dangerous. Most people think that there are about 10,000 of those in the world, and then it goes up by a factor of 10 from there. So if there are 10,000 category one, there are 100,000 category two, there are about a million category three, you know, category four and five. You have literally millions of legal shipments of radioactive materials annually in the world. So it's a huge, it would be a huge problem. I think uh, there's gonna be several problems when that happens. I actually wrote a paper that was published by FAS on is ISIL a radioactive threat that was a couple of years ago. And I was concentrating on the threat coming from the ISIL controlled areas. But outside the area, I should update the paper, you know, ISIS now has con not control of things, but they're being active, and they're no different than any of the other terrorist groups. I mean, uh, maybe better funded, you know, they're better funded. I certainly there would be a hue and cry, public hue and cry, that the IAEA ought to be somehow involved in doing something. But what they could do, you could maybe get uh, an insert five or CPBM like agreement, but. What could you get? I mean, it's a it's an agreement among the states then to secure materials at a higher level, uh, which we do in the United States. The NRC and DOE do that. We have two we have two controlling agencies in the United States. NRC controls basically most of the stuff uh, on the commercial side. About 37 of the 50 states are agreement states. So NRC has given up inspection and regulation of those materials, radioactive materials, to the agreement states. So in California, if the university has a big seasoning source here to do some sort of medical research, expose cancer cells or do something like that, that's covered by the California Office of Radiation Control or whatever their inspection group did. Uh, but they were supposed to follow the NRC guidelines. Uh, so it'd be, it would be a heck of a problem um, if they had detonated an RDD as part of the Brussels airport attack. Uh, it'd be a, a big cleanup problem. You wouldn't have had any more fatalities, but you know, you a big cleanup problem. Yeah. So that's I just for a follow up question. Uh, what involvement, if any, does the IE have with the development of remediation? And what remediation technology. Uh, as far as I know, not much, if any. I mean, it doesn't fall under any of the categories that, you know. So, uh, 
like for example, the EPA has cleanup standards, and they have cleanup standards which are flexible. And this is going to be one of the things. If you have an incident like this, it's going to be a real nightmare because their general cleanup standard is to clean up the only so that the residual is only twice the background. Level. But then their emergency standard is like 100 times the background level. And if you clean up to twice the background level, some of these things get horribly expensive. I was involved not in a radiation uh, spill, but in a PCB spill over in San Francisco, which shut down an entire square block office building for a year or so. And the loss was well in excess of $30 million, which got tagged to Westinghouse and PG&E. Uh, but you had, you had a one square block office building that was 30 stories high, and every office had to be clean. Uh, you know, there were people who had to, like some of the places were law firms. And how do you allow access to the law firm? They're working on cases. How do you allow them to get in and get their files and materials out, get them clean, and you know, proceed with doing their business? Ugly stuff. There's another question. Yes. You mentioned meeting that um, if the country doesn't conform to the IEA safeguards, and the technical cooperation. No, it's not safeguards. It's safety. Safety. If they don't, if they don't comply, let's say they run nuclear facilities and they don't comply with the safety guidance, and the IEA finds out about it, they're not supposed to get TC funds or and TC support. What? What? Where does that support come from? And what's like the scale of it relative to uh, the scale of it is. I mean, just budgetary wise from the IAEA, I don't know exactly. My gut feeling is it's about one fourth the safeguards budget. And it's directly, they send out people. There, there are two things that they do. One is, for example, they'll provide medical treatment equipment for cancer therapy. They'll provide for linear accelerators. They'll also provide uh, teletherapy machines, which contain radioactive sources. And actually, we're working with them to say, hey, Let's go light on the sources, particularly into countries that have known terrorist problems or unstable governments. So they supply that, they supply training for people, they bring people to Vienna, they also go out in the field and train people. Uh, so, you know, you see a lot of, when TC has a uh, program, you know, they have these uh, every couple of months in one of the halls, you see all these posters, there are things like, you know, sterilization of fruit flies with, you know, some irradiator that the agency has given the country. Uh, but they're they're basically into training people into human resource development and that sort of thing, uh, and and supplying equipment, mostly medical equipment and research equipment. Yes. Uh, quick question. So when you say safety standards, you're talking about people who have to wear gloves while working. Well, that would be that would be one safety standard. But the the the, the safety standards are are much more high level and global than that. I mean, they do get down to personal protection equipment, but so, as opposed to security, there's a reason for the law on the safety and security both have the same goal, which is protecting the public. It's just security protects the public from intentional activities of people, safety protects the public from unintentional things. Uh, and you know, you think of safety as both being like a nuclear ocean, but also it's safety by design, for example. In the wake of Fukushima, uh, safety department, the nuclear engineering part of safety department has come out with a lot of fixes and that sort of thing. But working in conjunction with the main manufacturer. Do you have a question? Yeah. So in uh, in bilateral nuclear technology agreements, like the ones that Russia engages with, like Bolivia or Argentina, Turkey, what's the role of the IAEA there? Very little. That would be more. Well, the role of the IAEA would be secondary. The role of the nuclear suppliers group, you know, Russia's member of the nuclear suppliers group, those agreements should come under nuclear suppliers group guidelines and should require for certain things that Bolivia have comprehensive safeguards for whatever is being supplied. So that would then add to the IAEA's inspection mandate in Bolivia. Yeah. Um, for Advanced nuclear reactor designs that are being proposed or have been proposed for a long time, but could be built feasibly maybe in 20 years or something. That purposely take waste material and breed new material. 
um, that kind of changes in different ways that states can come up with these significant quantities. Uh, is there, does the IADA try to keep, like, work hard to keep up with those designs? And I know that Russia recently connected, like, a sodium fast reactor to their electricity grid. Uh, Russia had two, at least two uh, fast reactors. One of them was in so in Kazakhstan, which were power grid reactors. Um, I think both of them went off line. Maybe they bought one of them back on. Uh, but they were uh, uh, fast reactors with the liquid metal cool. Uh, but the answer is yes, they try and anticipate that. How well they do it, I don't know. I mean, that's, you could probably find papers on things like that. There was a big, when, when, before Fukushima, when there was a lot of talk of nuclear renaissance, the IAEA was very proactive. It's interesting that if you look at the U.S. history, you had the Atomic Energy Commission. Then the Atomic Energy Commission was split because into the uh, Department of Energy and uh, uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission because the AEC was doing both promotion of nuclear power and regulation. The IAEA is subject to that same criticism. Criticism. It does promotion of nuclear energy and uh, use of nuclear material because that's the that's the quid pro quo of the NPT is that you know in in exchange for giving up nuclear weapons, states are supposed to be supplied with the benefits of peaceful use of nuclear material and nuclear energy. Does that answer your question? So I know there's public data or not in all of the different reactors that are on everywhere, but maybe you can ballpark how many, for example, Canadian green reactors and uh, fast reactors are there online? Canadian uh, fast reactors? I'm sorry, the can reactors. Oh, candy reactors, heavy heavy water reactors. Yeah. I don't know how many there are. I mean, I think I think that's publicly you can pick it up. I mean, outside of Canada, yeah. I'd be surprised India had some uh so does uh, uh romania or one of the states uh, has some candy reactors I, I would i would be surprised if it was over 20 and if you said it was 10 or less i wouldn't be surprised but that number is available candy reactors for your reactor I mean, it runs runs on natural uranium that's one of the reasons that it's a little scary from a proliferation point of view uh, plus the calandria fuel changer on the front end allows you to change, well, requires you to change fuel all the time. And when you're pushing fuel, new fuel in the front end, spin fuel is coming out the back end, uh, it's conceptually a lot easier to take some fuel that came out of the back end, switch the hot fuel for less hot fuel and take it off for reprocessing without anybody knowing. It's very similar. If you, if you ever get a chance, you can go up and you can actually see the B reactor at Hanford. It's now a national historical site. And you can go in and look at the front of the face and see. It's it's somewhat similar to, although it's a graphite moderator reactor, somewhat similar to the concept that we get in the reactor. Can I ask uh, a general question about life working at the IAEA? I mean, is, which is, I know you haven't been there in a while, full time. Is there a sense of where you're screwed for? Is it more a bureaucracy? University environment and is it free inquiry? Is it I think that like there's a slide. I, I sure, sure. I mean, I would say I really enjoyed my time there. There's a real um, it's a real nice experience in in nuclear security. We had a fair number of Brits, we had a fair number of Russians, we had a fair number of uh, French, uh, we had people from basically most of the nuclear power states. Uh, but we also have a cadre of people from, from other countries. And it's very nice to, to work with. Um, the language for the what's called a P staff, the professional staff, all works in English. The G staff, which is more the administrative support staff, uh, their language is German, both by and large. Although, they, you know, they type everything up. But when they're talking to each other, they're, you know, what are we going to do for the weekend? They're speaking German. Uh, I spoke German, which I never bothered to reveal to anybody for a day or a year, because I enjoyed being able to eavesdrop and find out what the G staff was really thinking about me. And then one day I kind of blew it when three of them were working on something, they had a computer problem, 
And I said, oh, well, that's simple. And they said, how did you know what the problem was? And I was like, dude, well, I heard what you said. And after that, I, I got a lot less intelligence from what you said, <laughs> surreptitiously. But there are places where, uh, you know, the, the life in the inspector is pretty hard life. Uh, they're on the road a lot. And now uh, they're compensated for that to some extent, but you, know, you have to like that kind of lifestyle. Uh, and and safeguards, I, we used to get a lot of extra safeguards. People would come to security and say, ah, I'm not on safeguards. But for some people, who prefer to be in safeguards to be in that environment. And safeguards is very different. The inspectors, there's what's called SGIM, Safeguards and Information Management. That's where they do like satellite surveillance and, and those information processing those are are uh, maybe better places to be i never felt that it was there's certainly things that are bureaucratic about it um, it's, it, it is a big bureaucracy in terms of things like travel regulations and that sort of thing but you live fairly well i mean when i was there if you had to fly in place and the total trip was one to six hours you know you flew uh, business class and uh, you know you were Pretty well compensated for the way you stay. It was not, it was not marginal, but you, this is kind of, we used to have the same, never travel with the safeguards inspectors. Because the safeguards inspectors were paid a flat per diem. So they always sought out the cheapest accommodations in low rent places in marginal areas of town. You just didn't want to stay with them for some time. But they pocketed the difference, and that was okay. <laughs> I mean, that was just the way they made a little extra money. I was not that interested in making extra money. But yeah, it's, it's a good place to work. There are a lot of benefits, uh, particularly. But the flip side of that, there is a great fear of uh, nepotism, not in the family sense. And I don't know the term for it, but um, feathering the nest of fellow countrymen. So, uh, it's very difficult for a young person to stay at the agency for more than seven years. At the end of seven years, they have to leave. Uh, now, for the people that you want to keep, you kind of try and stash them someplace in the DNA area with the idea that you'll have to hire them back after a year. They're eligible for rehire after a year. But it's not the place where you go right out of school and expect I'm going to work there at the IEA from you know, my mid 20s to my mid 60s and retire. It's also very brutal on the other end, there's mandatory retirement. Kick out the door in 64. Even though, and the, the, some of the Austrians have sued, uh, they've not gotten anywhere because Austrian law is like the period is in the United States. There's no, there's no mandatory retirement. But good benefits, one, Vienna is a wonderful place to live. Uh, I, I recommend it highly to Vienna. If, if you get a chance, go. And if, you're, if you have dual citizenship, it makes it much easier to go. And if you're interested in being an inspector, uh, the inspector staffing is run through Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, they, uh, all of this, there's a lot of politics. I was the uh, scientific secretary for the Director General's advisory group on uh, nuclear security. And we had about anywhere between 15 and 20 members to that group at very few amount of time. And when we have a vacancy, I would get calls from various ambassadors pushing their candidate from their country. Uh, and sometimes that got kind of ugly. Uh, so anytime at, at the P5 level, uh, I was at P5, but that's a sectional even level. Uh, at the P5 level, there's very sharp focus by not only people in the agency, but all the embassies about who gets those jobs and what country they come from. And you know, it's like, well, this, you know, for example, uh, when Amano came in as a DG, it was a given that our DDG for safety and security was Taniguchi, who was Japanese, that he would have to leave. You could not have a DG and a DDG from the same country. So Taniguchi was absolutely leave. His initial response, I think, was, why should I? Uh, it's not really the request. You know. <laughs> yes. It's on the same train of thought. So, how did you get involved with it? How did I get involved with this? Uh, I spent two tours of the Rumor Lab. Uh, the first one in the weapons program and, and in what we called C Division at the time. Uh, 
a small work within the C division who lent the idea. When I came back for the second time, uh, one day we were talking, and I said, hey, his name is George also. Hey, George. George Aslan. Yeah, George Aslan. I said, George, how'd you do that thing at the IE? And he said, you interested in going? I said, yeah, I'm interested in going. He said, let me make some phone calls. So I made a few phone calls. And I was doing something in Europe and then went to Vienna. And this is totally not the way things are done, even then. I had lunch with this guy and he said, when can you start? You got the job. Uh, that's not the way things are done, even then. But it all got done. And that's how I got there. And I spent, I was originally going to go for two years. I wound up spending five years. I had an extension up for seven years. But my wife had to come back because she would have lost tenure. And so she came back and did a long range thing for uh, a year or two. And that was fun in a lot of ways, but it was also very tiring in a lot of ways. So I came back and cut my tour a couple of years short with the Monterey. Okay, no more questions. Uh, taking up a lot of your time. So I, I'm curious. So you teach at Monterey? You can't teach at all. Uh, yeah. Well, this semester, this semester I'm teaching liquid forensics and coursing uh, diplomacy in the digital world, which is a combination of uh, cybersecurity, cybercrime, and uh, cyber warfare. We're just getting into cyber warfare. Uh, last semester I taught. Uh, Drones and surveillance, and of course, in cybersecurity. So I teach uh, like nuclear trafficking. Sometimes Monterey is kind of unusual. We do uh, one of the things they do are weekend workshops. We get unit for the credit. It starts on Friday at six o'clock and ends on Sunday at three or four in the afternoon. And I do those on like the CTBT, uh, nuclear materials, and nuclear trafficking. Uh, other, other basically, I teach nuclear stuff. Or cyber stuff. And the drone thing is kind of an ad. But we're trying to work the drone thing into looking at first defenders, our first responders, being able to map out things with cheap drones. Okay. Thank you, Thank you so much. I guess, you know, yeah, they will make this available to people. Sure. So we'll take a break. So, uh,